Hi everyone, it's uh, the Live Well podcast again for Diabetes Digital Media. I'm so excited today to invite uh, Steve Bennett to talk to us. He's a massively successful business leader and adventurer. He's a dad of seven children and employs more than a thousand people all over the world. Like myself, he's battled uh, with his weight in his adult life, um, but at 50 discovered how to restore his health and well-being. He's written several books. I've got at least one of them here uh, that we'll put links obviously to everything in the notes um, and I'm delighted to find out more about <laughs> about how it all happened and also to chat everything uh, to do with kind of food and uh, and recovery from sugar addiction yeah great. so welcome Steve <laughs> thanks well, thanks for giving to... us the time no you're welcome great to be here so my first question is um, in of your kind of person so two sides really so obviously we'll talk about your mission and all the amazing work that you're doing to raise awareness about the dangers of sugar but first I'm really interested in in your your own journey and um, how we all keep learning really over you know all the time how sorry notifications on the phone um, so do you feel that you're now kind of at, at your peak well-being or do you feel you've kind of got, have you still got further to go? Have you still got more to, more to learn? I think we've always got more to learn. Um, so break that question down into two, shall we? So uh, am I at my peak fitness? I'm hoping that I'm still going to get fitter and fitter. Yeah. 54 years old. Still haven't got the six pack I'd so desire, which is really crazy uh, that my age should be even chasing a six pack. Um, yeah. So no, I'm not as fit as... I want to be yet. Um, am I the fittest I've ever been? I'm certainly the fittest I've been in the last 30 years. I was probably at my peak at 24. Uh, I used to do a lot of international uh, racing and sailing, and that's kind of when I started to step back from sailing. Uh, and back then I was super fit. Um, yeah. And then sort of started my own business at 24. And then while I was doing that, sort of the food. It all goes to the wayside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> eating on the run all the time and you're eating junk food without realizing back then it was junk food and then the weight came on and on and on so yeah. i spent 30 years of my life pretty much obese uh and then uh, well 25 years of it and then mm. uh in uh, when i was 49 my wife said pregnant with another child and we'd had like a six or seven year break and uh, i went oh crikey you know i'm overweight uh i'm worried about my health i've got you know, nothing really severe other than being obese but other problems like wasn't sleeping as well as I should and you know, lots of coughs and colds and other things and uh, so yeah. I wasn't in terrible health but I wasn't in good health but I was I was frightened and I'd lost some friends to cancer and I, and all along throughout my 30s 40s I thought good goal for me would be to get to 60 <laughs> because wow. my lifestyle is the lifestyle I've got and I yeah. thought yeah, I'll get to 60 that's fine see most of my kids grow up a little bit but then knowing a new baby was on the way, mm. I mean, I've got to change my plan. I've got to get beyond 60 somehow. And, uh, uh, and now, by the way, my target's over 100. I'm gunning for 100. <laughs> Longevity. <laughs> I've realised now you can control so much more. Yeah. When you're surrounded with people that have been ill and, like, say, good close friends dying and things like that, you think, oh, it's, it's out of our control. But the reality mm. is, and the good news is, A, you can turn it around quicker than everybody realises, and, and, and B... You really are in a lot more control than we realise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, what are your ultimate best hopes then for your own work? So, six pack, live to a hundred. <laughs> what else? How do you, you know, how do you know when you're at your own peak, if you like, in terms of, like, just ev just every day? What do you know? What would you notice if you were, like, you know? That's a brilliant question. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yesterday was uh, I've done quite a lot of three day fasts. And I've done a lot of three-day fasts when I wrote my last book, uh, Fat and Furious. Uh, we'll talk about that title maybe in a bit. But um, mm. I, I just finished a four-day fast, which is the first time I've ever done it. And I will, I'll be absolutely honest, the best I felt <laughs> in 30 years was yesterday at the, at the end of my four-day fast. I felt great. No hunger Isn't that amazing? Anything. Yeah. I jumped on the scales. I was happy. I did all my blood tests. I was happy with everything. It was just... So yesterday I felt really, really good. Uh, although last night, I'll be absolutely honest, I did go out to a restaurant with my wife when I ended the fast and I did have a little bit too much to drink. I woke up this morning, I felt terrible. So um, 
<laughs> we're always learning learning point yeah exactly yeah. always always learning and 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 noticing you know that's what i'm yeah. a real big fan of people noticing what I think, I think we can go through life, as you say, you're so busy, you're getting on with everything, you're looking after the family, you're not really noticing your own yeah. mental and physical health and conditions, so noticing when, when do we feel amazing. Yeah, yeah, so... Well, when, so I, when, I, when I first was told I was obese, as in technically obese, I was at 31% body fat, and uh, I sat down with a doctor, I'd just walked the North Pole, I mean, walked the North Pole uh, months <laughs> Wow. Uh, and that's 10 days on the ice, minus 40 degrees, all documented, it's, it's all up on YouTube. And, uh, uh, and a lot of people say they've been to the North Pole, it's very different, sort of being dropped in by a helicopter and actually walking. It's anyway, come on, story short, we had walked it. And I'm there with my doctor, like, literally a week later, and she goes, hang on, you've just walked to the North Pole, did that involve a lot of training? I went, training like you wouldn't believe you know for the last year i've been big tractor tire big chain around it around my waist walking around the village everybody going look at that idiot what's he doing dragging a tractor tire around behind him and uh, so i trained i trained i trained but i'm sitting there in the doctor's surgery and she says you're a beast and i'm like well i know i'm fat but i wouldn't say i'm a beast no she said technically you're, you're a beast and I, and, and I almost broke down. It was like, well, I don't understand it. Yeah. And, and, and now, you know, what we've learned, and, you know, interviewing great doctors like yourself and Asim, and, yeah, the bigger picture is you can't out-train a poor diet. Mm. So I was jogging, I've run marathons, I've done, sailed across the Atlantic, I've done so many different adventures. Mm. Think, and you think, well, you must be fit doing all that stuff. And I, I mean, I trained more through while I was a beast. I was running more while I was a beast than I do now. Mm run at all now and yet now the weight's cost so you can't out train a bad diet and and that that was that was the realization of my doctor four years ago i'm going well crikey if i'm technically obese i've got to do something about it my wife's pregnant and how, how do i do it and she said well maybe just cut back on the training for a bit and let's start focusing on what you're actually eating and uh, and uh, obviously your your podcast series is right on the money because <laughs> sugar is addictive in, in all its forms yeah 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 so that was great advice really from her at that point wasn't it you know you yeah. can it, it, you don't always kind of get the great so that that's interesting really so so then what what have been the things that that you've built on to get where you are now because obviously as you say you know there's still a way to go but you've yeah. obviously you know put in the various components to get yeah. a, a, as far along the journey as you have now what what for you are the the things that have really made a difference to get you where you are I think the biggest takeaways of all, uh, and for those that don't know, uh, I've got a podcast series, uh, I've, I've done the book, and my book's a little bit different because I interviewed 23 amazing people, including Jen and Wynn. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so my book, I, 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 in some ways I feel like a bit of a fraud because my book, I'm not a doctor, uh, I, you know, I've got no medical training, actually, I've got no letters after my name whatsoever. Um, I'm a businessman that had a journey to turn his health around. And... Uh, but by interviewing all 23 of you, I sort of pulled all this picture together. And what I would say the biggest learning of all is, is that you, all these fad diets, diets just don't work. And I'm living proof of that because it wasn't like I wasn't trying over you know, my 20s, 30s and 40s to lose weight. I tried everything going, yeah. Uh, and, and I think the realisation, and I think the person that, that sort of said it as distinctly as possible was uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jason Fung. And Dr. Jason Fung says, look, if you try and restrict your calories coming in, so let's say you're going to do a calorie restricted diet, you drop by 500 calories, actually your metabolism slows down to match because of homeostasis. So the whole thing really, you never lose any weight, you just feel tired. Yeah. And if you're trying to calorie restrict, yeah. uh, then you, you know, haven't got so much energy. So you're, it, and it never, just never, never works. You're just chasing but, on you with the exercise, as you say, yeah. and that whole calorie mentality, which is yeah. sort of, you know, yeah. as if the body's some sort of mathematical <laughs> formula. Yeah. Eat less, so, uh, run more. So, and and, and then I run. You, you're just chasing it all the time, yeah. Yeah, so about that, Jen, I think I talked over you then. No, go on. Are you, are you going to edit this afterwards at all? Are you doing it straight? Or? No, we're, we're straight. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Great. I'm uh, sorry I talked over you then. Uh, it's okay. I think, I think the key thing there is, so my big learning then was, well, if the diets don't work, let's mm. learn about food. And, and the basic step of learning about food is understanding the difference between carbohydrates, fat, and protein. And the, for those that are, are new to this area, I say it's like, look, it's not about calories because all calories aren't equal. Calories from carbs are very different to calories from practice. Uh, fat and from protein and it's a bit like saying a hundred pounds as in english cash a hundred euros 
and $100 are all the same thing. Yes, technically they're all the same thing. There are 100 as in their count. They are a currency, but they actually buy you very different things. That's so, really great. I've not heard, never heard that. That's great. That's in the new book. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the first thing you've got to do if you want to lose weight, you want to get fit and healthy, is to understand about food, understand why we eat, what we eat, and what functions carbohydrates do in the body, what functions fat do in the body when you're eating it, what functions proteins do. So then when you start to understand food, you realize it's not about counting calories, yeah? Because if you count calories and you restrict it, your body down rate regulates its metabolism, yeah. uh, and therefore you just haven't got the same energy. So it's about eating the right foods. And, and also, you, you and I, who were, who were sugar addicts, I would always choose, if I was counting calories, I'd always choose to have those calories as carbohydrate because that was my favorite thing. <laughs> Yeah. so if i did weight watchers or something i'd just eat the i think you were allowed sort of it sounds disgusting now but tins of sort of um macaroni cheese was uh, was allowed yeah. so I, you know i just ate stuff like that because i loved it and if you think nutritionally that was just a shocking advice because yeah. it, it, i would go days without eating any protein yeah and in fact you think about it logically and i hadn't put two and two together on this one before we think about all the things we used to eat when we were calorie restricting you know, and your husband's done that brilliant thing about converting teaspoons full of sugar on different food types. You look at the top of that list. So nearly in every diet I was on, baked potatoes was allowed because that's a, you know that's a vegetable and but it, you know that, that's got to be good for you. And yet one big baked potato turns into twenty spoons full of sugar or eighteen or whatever it is inside yeah. the body. It's one of the worst things you can have. And and then the other thing you think, well, you know, because you're doing marathons all the time, well, you're carb loading, so carbs must be good for you because we have to have pasta the day before. You need the it. For you a run. need, you need it. it. <laughs> yeah. so, so when you're calorie restricting, if you are calorie restricting and you've not read all the current thinking and all the current books, I'm not the only one obviously beating this drum about cut down the carbohydrates. You know, it's, luckily the whole world's waking up now to this. But if you don't realise that it's the carbs that are causing the problem, you're calorie restricting, you're eating all the wrong things as well. It's just, it's, uh, but it just doesn't work. And I'm yeah. living, you know, it doesn't work and you feel more tired actually and more sort of run down because you're not actually getting yeah. the things that your brain needs and your body needs to Well, to well the, the, the reason the sugar addiction is real. So you think about, you've gone for a run, so your energy's come down, you've burnt some calories, you've, you've had a run, you, 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 because you're sugar addicted, you now want some more food quick, you want some energy to replace the energy you've just put out. The first thing you're going to reach for is something that is full of sugar because the brain knows that's the thing that will quickly turn into energy the fastest. So you've just done that run. So now you have the Snickers bar or the Mars bar and a, and a, and a LucasAid drink. Or the banana uh, if you're being healthy. <laughs> <laughs> or a banana. Yeah. And, 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 and you've put more energy back in the body than you've just expelled in, in an hour's run. And in that hour's run, you've damaged your knee. So in the long run, anyway, you're <laughs> yeah. not going to be as healthy. You know, yeah. I'm one knee replacement already. And it's just like, I feel so sorry. I'm going off topic a bit. But I feel so sorry for people when I'm driving into work. I look and I see somebody obviously overweight, trying their hardest to lose the weight by jogging. I feel like stopping the car and saying, yeah. you, you look in so much pain. You look in agony. It looks terrible. What are you doing to yourself? You know, I best, agree. Can't out exercise a bad diet. In fact, Seema Lotra says it better. Says you can't out exercise your fork. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I, always, I totally agree. And then your heart really goes out to people eating like you know these light yogurts and things. You think, oh, you don't actually have to eat. You don't have to suffer in this way. You know, you can actually, yeah, all the things we've had to unlearn. So well, for when you, you when, when you picked up my first book, there, if you read the the cover, uh, whatever you call it, subtitle, I said there. The secrets the food industry, governments and, and, and pharmaceutical companies don't want you to know. And it drives me insane that we are in this supposedly you know, caring world that where everybody's supposed to be looking after each other. It drives me insane when I'm driving down a motorway and a lorry goes past me and the back of that whole lorry is saying, zero fat yogurt. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> these corporations are trying to brainwash everybody that fat's the enemy. And it's not the enemy. Sugar's the enemy, you know. Yeah. There's another great book called uh, The Salt Fix uh, by uh, Dr. James Dini Can I can never say Dini Calantonia. <laughs> and uh, that's the best one I've ever done. Um, <laughs> Dr. James in his Salt Fix says, is the reason that we've all had a go at salt because the salt industry is so, so small compared to the sugar industry. And actually, if you have loads of salt, you don't crave as much sugar. So the best thing the sugar industry can do 
is paint Salt as the bad guy. And the reality is, as I remember from a podcast I did with, with, with your husband, that, that actually, you know, uh, uh, most people, unless you've got a problem with your kidneys, you can't have too much salt anyway. Your body just you know, deals with it. So, uh, anyway, again, off topic, but... Uh, no, but oh, endlessly fascinating, isn't it? All the yeah. things we've had to unlearn. I was yeah. listing them the other day. You know, all the things we've had to unlearn, you and I, to get where we are now, because we were getting nowhere, <laughs> yeah. trying, to, trying to follow the conventional advice. Um, so, so and, and, and one of the things that, I don't know if this has been mentioned uh, on the sugar addiction, but I've got a sort of a theory of why this happens. And, and all my books uh, have been about living primarily and you know, getting back to eating what the body's designed to eat, getting back to exercising in a way that the body should be exercising. So my belief quickly on exercising, for example, is shouldn't be doing long jogs, <laughs> says an ex-marathon runner. Um, what you should be doing is walking a lot more because that's what the body's designed for, occasionally sprinting once you've got, but don't even try that till you've got your weight roughly where you need it because that's dangerous. Uh, and, and lifting heavy stuff. But anyway, back to the primal thing. So my theory on why sugar is so addictive is because it had to be. I think if sugar wasn't addictive, there would be no human race. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you, before fridges and before you know, being able to import food from all around the world, we've only got to go back a few hundred years uh, and we start to look at what was life like then. Well, you know, fruit came out, let's take the UK, fruit came out only at one time a year, which is the autumn. Can't store it because we haven't got fridges, so what do we do? So the body has to take in lots and lots and lots of sugar quickly over a period of a few weeks to get us through the winter. Now, there is some, you know all this, I'm teaching you to suck eggs here, but you know, there's a hormone called leptin, and leptin goes to the brain, supposedly, to tell us that we're full, to stop eating. It works great, with protein, functions beautifully with protein, functions beautifully with fat, but it doesn't function, it appears as well with carbohydrates. And the reason I, th I believe that this is so is simply because if leptin, which is supposed to tell us to stop eating, worked as well with carbohydrates, then once we'd had two or three apples, we'd go, oh, oh, oh I'm so full, I'm not mm -hmm. having another apple. But we yeah. needed back then in the autumn to be stuffing our face with, with you know, nature's candy because that was how we got fat, and that's how we yeah. got fat. That's how we got through the winter where, you know, take England, you know, what are you going to eat in the winter? There's very little available uh, food supply. So, so I think, the, and this is why, the, on the scientific side of things, I believe sugar is addictive, because it had to be addictive before we now have this endless support. You know, you and I, and nearly everybody in the country today, if at any point we feel hungry, we can always go and find some food today. Yeah. It just drops everywhere and sadly it's all. <laughs> you came to my TV studios to do uh, a room. Yeah. Yeah. Within 100 metres of my front door, my TV studios, I've got now a Subway, a Greg's and a McDonald's. Where can I get anything healthy? It's just, oh my yeah. gosh. You know? yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's addictive because it had to be addictive. And the yeah. problem now, now we've got endless supply of food. Yeah. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want it. Um, leptin's just not working with, 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 yeah. with, with sugar and therefore, you know, and because uh, of, of, of insulin and because the way that, you know, sugar is poisoning the body and then because when you've got glucose, you release insulin, it grabs the sugar and it puts it in your fat stores. And because that happens so quick, I call it the carbo coaster. Putting something like that, it's carbohydrates, turns into sugar inside the body something like a 30 gram tiny little servings about eight or nine teaspoons of sugar inside the body insulin grabs it pushes it away all of a sudden your kids are hungry again by 10 o'clock 11 o'clock yep. and what feed them at school bloody sample oh, let me retract that sorry uh, <laughs> it's okay. yeah it's and because and the, you know, it's so about it you know it's 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 uh you know you, what it's almost like once the scales have fallen from our eyes you just see see it everywhere don't you that well, yeah my new book's called fat and furious because I, I was fat for all those years and i'm furious that actually yeah. the truth is quite simple but it's it's clouded by all these you know all corporations yeah let me retract that most corporations unless they're what we call a b corporation their sole job is to maximize return on investment for their shareholders there is a new thing called b corporation uh, in america and it's just coming across to the uk now which we're trying to turn our company into a b corporation uh, and a b corporation doesn't have to have making profit as its primary goal it can have other things as a primary goal hopefully putting people and the planet before profits but mm -hmm. most companies their job is to maximize 
uh, return on investment for shareholders. Yeah. That's so sad because when, you, when that's your goal, whether you're Coca-Cola, Nestle, when that's your goal, you pay lobbyists to keep the truth out of the media. You keep, you've got, your job is to sell, 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 sell. Yeah. It's not about, and which it should be, about public health. It's about corporate wealth. Yeah. Corporate wealth trumps public health every single time. So how do I make my yoga addictive so that somebody comes back and wants it again tomorrow? And, and again the day after. And how do I do it so that if I manage my stock badly, it's got such a long shelf life that I never have to write off my, you know, my stock. So I need to last longer. I need it to be addictive. And I need to be as cheap as hell to make it because I need to maximize my profit. So there's the three goals for all food companies. How do I make the most profit? I stuff it full of product and produce we know is addictive sugar we yeah. take out anything <laughs> that, that that if it might be we'll take out some good stuff if that good stuff doesn't make it as addictive it's just and, the, and then we end up with these products that we yeah. are highly addictive because they're being designed they're being yeah. engineered to be addictive and that's why the book was called fat and furious because yeah. i'm so furious yeah. seven and two grandchildren now it's just like, oh my gosh because oh, no. even though my kids believe me everywhere and they have arguments with their teachers at school about what the, what's on the dinner plate and the options and, and my yeah. kids are very fortunate they're really good schools but it, you know, even in those good schools they're still feeding my kids <laughs> rubbish and every time they came complain about it my daughter does uh, uh, food technology at, at school and uh, and she's just they're all so wrong and it's just like so the problem we've got you yeah. have to go in fact uh, another doctor dr patrick uh, holford said you've got to educate everybody steve to follow the logic and not the money. Yeah. So you've got to understand that the whole food industry really doesn't care about your health. They care yeah. about making money. I That's like the that. Money. Let's follow the logic. What's the logic about food? Well, the logic obviously was that, you know, it, it, and there's some research that shows that a male adult in the 1870s had a longer life expectancy than I've got today over 100 years ago, my life expectancy, according to some researchers, is 10 years more than my children's life expectancy. Well, where, how is this all going so wrong? How yeah. can that happen, it's, yeah? Yeah, how can that happen? And, and it's packaged food. It's packaged food. Sugar's in everything. We have to cut down the sugar. We have to cut down the carbohydrates. And then we start to feel full quicker because we're eating more fiber. We're eating you know, food that makes us feel full. Uh, and, and, but you have to make that switch. You've got to make that switch for your health sake. And, and, and honestly, for people that are watching, it happens so quickly once you do it that it's fascinating. And I'm, yeah. I'm, you're a GP and I'm not, and I, maybe you'll disagree with this one, but many GPs... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> husband, sorry, GP. Uh, yeah. Yeah, many GPs will say, oh, you shouldn't lose weight too quick. And I've got totally... Op if you're not on any medication, I've got the opposite view. I think lose that weight quickly because once you step on those and it's all going in the right direction you know you're doing the right thing so quick weight loss at the beginning for me is what it's all about when I'm trying to help people and the way we do it is we just have a zero carb rule for that first week so I teach them what protein is I teach them what good fat looks like because there are some bad fats uh, and then we try and maximize that weight loss in that first week because then they see it then they get it um Sorry, I've waffled on way too much. No, 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 it's fine. No, it's it's fantastic, and that's what I that's what I love about you is that passion and that kind of mission, really. So my next question would be, what what's your ultimate? We're all about goals, aren't we? So, yeah. what's your what's your ultimate aim and, and your best hopes for for the for the mission or for the you know where would you? What well, what would you personally what, classify as success, maybe yeah. in ten years' time? My wife had an interesting one last night, and I don't know where it came from, but I, I just finished, like I say, my four-day fast, and we did have a few little drinks last night. It was a bit naughty, because nothing wrong with one or two glasses of wine, but we went a bit beyond that, which was a bit of a failure. But um, my wife said, uh, we're talking about this very thing, she said, uh, I think you're deliberately trying to end up in jail for really offending one of the food companies. And I went, you know what, if I get locked <laughs> up at some point for really, really digging the needle into one of those food companies, maybe that's my ultimate goal, but obviously I don't want to end up in jail. So if anybody watching from Nestle, <laughs> Coca-Cola, that's... Yeah, you know, hands off. Uh, but what, what, would you be, what would you be trying to achieve, you know? Yeah, I, I haven't put a number on it because I've, I've never done that in any of my businesses. And people find that a bit strange. Uh, you know, twice we, my companies have been the fastest growing companies in the UK. So know a bit about getting things 
to speed and scale. But you do those things, I, I personally, everybody's different, without an actual sort of figure at the end. The thing is, how can I get the message out to as many people as possible that you've just got to take your blinkers off, stop following the money, follow the logic, and, and, start, and, 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 and yeah, the more families I can help, the yeah. more children I can help, you know, is the, maybe the goal for me is if I get to 100, then actually what I've been preaching probably works. Um, yeah, uh, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, in, the, in my wheelchair, I'm five years old, being pushed around by my great, great, great grandchildren. Um, so no, I mean, the key thing is let's do, we just can keep getting the message out. I'm yeah. working hard with you guys at the PhD to try to get the government to change the guidelines on food. The guidelines yeah. are problem you know and some people say well people don't follow guidelines but sadly maybe individuals don't but businesses and schools and hospitals do so you know i, I struggle to argue the headmaster at my children's school about food when there are guidelines that are the wrong guidelines so uh, i think the first mm -hmm. thing that uh, if we can achieve will be to get rid of the guidelines or at least get them changed or get rid of them completely because how can you have guidelines on food when everybody's different? How can a guideline for my dad who's diabetic, how can the food he eats be the mm. same as what my mum who's got Alzheimer's eats? Uh, how can that be the same as me who's trying to keep my weight now where it is? Well, maybe another two or three pound off. Uh, but my children are growing. So how, how, you know, we've all got slightly different needs. So I think we either need a dozen different guidelines or no guidelines. So the first achievement will be to try and get rid of that. I'm meeting with uh, the brilliant uh, Tom Watson uh, next week to be discussing that. Um, yeah. He, you know, he had a great health journey as well. Um, so that's the first thing we're trying to do. And then just keep getting the message out. And I think one by one, um, you know, we're seeing the likes of Coca-Cola sales diminishing uh, in Europe because the word's getting out. There's too much sugar in there and so on and so forth. Sadly, they're now poisoning uh, Asia and, and, and they coat those, they, you know, what they're losing in, 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 the, in the sort of westernized world. They're now gaining yeah. China and India. And I've just come back from India. I'm off to the, the, the Himalayas in about 24 hours of time. But um, um, I just come back from India. You know, diabetes, like you, you think it's escalating here. My gosh, we're nothing now compared to India. It's, yeah. it's, got, it's, got, it's just everywhere I turn. Everywhere I turn. My managing director's husband's got it and I sat there and, and, and I feel so sorry for them, even worse in India, because of, yeah. uh, because of the, the, the way the families all sit together and the way they eat. And, and certainly in Jaipur, where I've just been, you know, the, the naan bread comes with every single meal. And, and he was saying that he gets it, he's got his diabetes, and I'm, I'm going to help him revert. So I'm sure we can put him in remission because he gets it. But the problem you've got in other countries, it, it, it's just the way those families interact, all eating together. And, you know, he said, if I sit, and this guy's in his 40s, but he said, if I sit to my mom and turn down her uh, uh, the jabati or, you know, her, her, her bread, what do they call it? Uh, no, bread. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. I'll keep that house. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. it's a long way to go there, isn't there? Long, yeah. Long way. yeah. 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 And, and yet, why is it? Why is it suddenly getting worse? So it, it can't it can't just be the chapatis, can it? Because they've always had that. It must be. But but, but again, more it's a bit sugary like, foods. Like, and... you know, your husband says, "I'm absolutely right." A small bowl of rice turns into I can't remember the exact numbers now, but fifteen or sixteen teaspoons of sugar inside the body. So then the argument I always get thrown back to me is, "Well, if rice is so full of sugar when we digest it, turns into sugar, how come all of Asia haven't put on lots of weight?" Well, the reality is, it was their stable diet, mm. and while it was just that that there was a stable diet yeah. and nothing else or very little else, it wasn't so much of a problem because the real problem comes. So uh, again, uh, Dr. Patrick Holford explains it brilliantly, brilliantly. In nature, what we eat, if it once had a face on it, be fish, cattle, whatever, it's predominantly fat and protein. Yeah. If it didn't have a face on it, vegetables, it's predominantly carbohydrates and protein, but rarely in nature. And there's a few examples that are a bit different, like milk and avocados and cut the nuts, but with about two or three exceptions, you never get yeah. a lot of fat and a lot of carb carbohydrates together in nature. But yeah. if you look at all packaged food, that's what we're eating. We're eating a huge amount of carbohydrates and fat at the same time. And in so many experiments with, with, with mice and rats, when they put them on this diet, they just explode in size. So yeah. the main problem, it's not just so much the carbohydrates on their own are terrible, but it's the carbs and the fat together. So yeah. why we're seeing this explosion now in, in Asia and China and India 
is while they were just eating rice, first of all, they didn't eat lots and lots of it. It wasn't yeah. so much a problem. But now they're being more westernized. You know, we're yeah. not seeing massive diabetes raises uh, in India out in rural areas. We're talking about people living in Mumbai and Jaipur and the cities and, and, and Delhi and so on. Yeah. It's because now they're trying to eat what they've always eaten, high bread, high rice, et cetera, et cetera. But now combining that with all the with Western, the Western diet. And, it, and, yeah, and, and they're, they're having the can of Coke full of sugar. Then they're having the rice and, 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 the, and the beastie rate. And, the, and I just heard a figure this morning back here in the UK about you know, the, the number of amputations now uh, in the UK for diabetes. Yeah. It's gone up something like 10, 15% in whatever the years was, 10 years, 15 years, something yeah. like that. So, Horrendous. You know, it's escalating because we have so much food choice and we're picking the wrong food. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, obesity is nothing more the wrong food choice. There's nothing, there is no other reason. It's just wrong food choice, but it's not the individual's fault. It's the lack of knowledge out there. And even when you try to go and search the truth, all yeah. those corporations will do everything they can everything, to stop yeah. you finding out the truth because it's in their interest. And the only reason their company is there is to make profit for their shareholders. Yeah. So that, that you're up. So it sounds I'm being like a, a lecturer if I say to somebody, the only reason you're obese, the only reason I was obese for almost 30 years, I made the wrong food choices. Yeah. But was it my fault? Was it the person that's listening to, to the podcast now? Was it their fault? No, of course no. not. Our brains were hijacked. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a great yeah. word. Though. Nobody, nobody, nobody chooses. No. Nobody chooses to be overweight or diabetic not. or no, of yeah. course not. Yeah. 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 No, and, uh, absolutely. And then, uh, you know Nina uh, Ty Schultz, brilliant, brilliant uh, writer from America, and she said something, and I thought it was absolutely beautiful what she said. And she said, "Look, you know, a lot of people say it's really difficult those first few weeks to cut down the carbs, become sort of keto adapting, and so on." And she said, "You know, it is a bit hard because it is hard the first few weeks. You do feel a little bit hungry, and yeah. you do miss sugar, and so on and so forth." But what she said was so elo eloquent. She said, "That is hard, but also living a life of being unwell." And being obese, being diabetic is also difficult. So what's more difficult? Is it more difficult to live a life where we're not well or for a few weeks say, I'm going to flick that switch. I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to read a few of these books. And it's always best to read a few of those books first, including mine. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's not for profit, by the way. Mine's 100% the profits uh, given to charity. Um, read some books, understand it, and then go, right, this is the day I'm going to start. I'm going to clear all that junk out. Because you, you need a start point, I think. Because if you don't, you know, and you've still got all the wrong food in the cupboard at home, it's so easy. And you, yeah. and you need to get preparation because if you do in that first few weeks of, of trying to move to the proper side of food, if you do feel hungry, almost invariably you're going to drive past a Greg's or a Subway or a McDonald's or a Burger King or whatever. Yeah. So you need a bit of preparation for the first week. You've got to clear all the crap out of the cupboard at home. You've got to get some snacks ready from the go in case the first few weeks you do get hungry but they're healthy snacks not the junk snacks and I make that decision I'm going to do it yeah. and yes it is difficult the first week two weeks but after that it becomes so easy believe it or yeah. not like I just did four days zero calories you know if you'd have said that to me in my 20s 30s and 40s I'd have said what everybody's now saying to me that's nuts you can't it's do can't do it you can't do it hungry. you'll be, you'll be I, I felt the best I felt you know yeah. it's great yeah yeah, no, it's yeah. amazing, isn't it? Yeah, we have to, it's it's the invite, it's um, like you say, it's it's kind of, it, it's everywhere. And it, now we're so culturally into the whole celebrate everything with sugar thing. Yeah. And, you know, it, I, it, I mean, even even in our lifetimes, that's changed massively, I think. I think it's, yeah. it, it, is, it is a worry so for our grandchildren now. Yeah, yeah. It is, you know, it, it, is literally everywhere every celebration um just mountains and mountains yeah. of I mean, that, chocolate that, and it's normalized another, another doctor you know uh, james gulnick who's the dentist one of the top dentists in the uk uh, has got a charity all about what you're saying there the reward system and you know I, and i still see it now my kids go to parties and they come back with a goodie bag and you open it, it's just full of sweets it's it's just awful. Full. yeah yeah <laughs> i think we're gonna have a long way probably not in my lifetime will we get rid of the birthday cake but um but yeah, you know, luckily my wife's come around to the thinking now because we have, obviously with all our children, uh, we have lots of parties and lots of goodie bags. And she's come around to the, you know, putting little books now and stickers and, and things that yeah. aren't sugar. 
but I don't think we'll ever get away from the birthday cake. But yeah, we've got to change the reward system. We've got to yeah. stop brainwashing our kids with the, uh, oh, you've done well there. Yeah, here's a sweet. In fact, <laughs> the other week, it was a Sunday morning. I'll be quick and then I'll, I'll let you go. Um, That's but, fine. Um, the other week, I, my wife had, had, had a late night on Saturday. I thought, I got up, my son was crying, so I got up, he's my young one's four, and I got up really early with him and we're doing stuff. I'm doing all that, I'm in a perfect dad. I'm in that mood on this day. I'm going to be the perfect dad today. And I'm playing with him, with him Lego, we're watching Peppa Pig, doing all these things. And then, he, and, and then I think, I'm going to get a newspaper. <laughs> I put him on my shoulders because he doesn't want to walk. And we go down to the corner shop to buy a newspaper. What does he do? He nags me for a Kinder Egg and a cave in, right? Because I don't want to see him in the shop with my four-year-old on a day that's supposed to be the day dad's doing everything right. So I get the Kinder Egg and we get to the checkout and there's this little pack of little sweets that he likes and he moans. And I walk out of that shop and I go, I can't believe this. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> oh, no. I finished writing my book. I'm trying to be the perfect dad. I've just been bullied by a four-year-old. Yeah. But they're addicting. That's the problem. Back to yeah. And they're, ap and they're advertised to children. And yeah, yeah. Once, once, the, once the children have had that kind of hit, then yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe my goal of success you asked earlier on, how will I know yeah. when I'm there? Maybe if in one week I don't see any of my children eating anything <laughs> that he's, he's out there for corporate greed and not public health, you know, but yes. maybe, maybe that week when they don't touch anything they shouldn't have. But I'm getting there. You know, you yeah. can get to my house and uh, you know, I've still got one of my kids still eat cereals. I, I, I'm trying to convince my wife, just, just don't even put them in the house. Then they won't be don't buy them. Yeah. All the rest of them are great. The rest of them have you know, healthy food in the morning. And uh, you know, how many eggs we get through. And I know your husband's trying to convince me to have a chicken at home. I've just moved house, by the way. So I probably can't oh, have, have, you? <laughs> I probably can have chickens in the garden now. Oh, um, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm waffling on. I hope no, it's you. So Listen, it's a fantastic mission. There's there's a long way for all of us to go, but at, at least there's a lot of people now sort of uh, yeah. fighting on the same messages, isn't there? Um, other than um, obviously your books, which obviously we'll mm -hmm. put the links to and we'll um, recommend to people. Are there, are there any particular kind of books or podcasts that help you yes. along the way or that you felt you w would you recommend to other people? Well, I am shamelessly going to plug my own podcast uh which is yep. fat and furious which you're on one of them which is great um and uh, what i've done there is because i'm not the expert i've just into so I've, okay i'm worried about say cancer who's the best three guys i can get in cancer or heart disease you know who's yeah. the best three doctors for heart disease so i went out for heart disease got dr c malotra uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, you know, both great authors, both written books. Uh, another one, Ivor Cummings, who you know, you introduced me to him, uh, was, was absolutely brilliant. So my podcast is pretty cool. Uh, there's a podcast series uh, by Dr. Shan Hussein, which is brilliant. There's a YouTube channel by another one of our friends, uh, Dr. Dan Maggs, uh, called Carb Dodging. Uh, and he's getting some great success there. He's got sort of 100,000 followers now. Uh, obviously, diabetes.co.uk um, yeah. is a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, information source. Um, books that are brilliant. Um, if you've got kids that are always on their mobile phone, is there any depression in the family? Uh, uh, Robert Lustig's book, uh, Hacking the American Mind, I mm. think you can get it in the UK now. Yeah. Um, is, is truly wonderful. Um, oh, what do you have a book? I mean, they're all. As long as it's around <laughs> reducing carbohydrates, uh, that, that they're all great, great books. So Rob's yeah. some of the cookbooks out there now. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, what's your and my good Cal friend? Daisy. Cal Daisy, Cal Daisy cookbook. Family, uh, yeah, great books. There's a new one out in March, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so the great cookbooks. Um, so yeah, anything, any book that tells that truth about there is only one way to get your weight under control, which is cut down the carbohydrates. Yeah. And at the same time, look at the quality of the food you're eating, try and go organic, try where you can uh, and go natural, try and avoid as much packaged food as possible. Mm. You know, that's the answer. And uh, yeah, carb dodging on YouTube. Uh, my own company, Primal Living, um, um, has quite a lot of videos up uh, on YouTube as well. Um, yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. Steve, you, as ever, you've put it so passionately and so clearly. <laughs> We just—it's just simple, isn't it? We just need to keep going, spreading the word, 
and help yeah you've just got to find food that hasn't got a label on it if it hasn't got a label on it you're yes. pretty safe if it's got a yes. label think twice before you eat it uh, that, that's the problem for the corporations isn't it they're not going to make a lot of money out of that but uh, but yeah let, let's keep fighting so it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and Likewise, Jen. with your future um projects and adventures thank you very much thanks a lot thank